Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be able to make this presentation on State of the World's Birds report on behalf of the BirdLife Partnership. Some of you who've been at uh, BirdLife Congresses before will be familiar with these reports because we produced uh, the first version of this in 2004 at our Congress in Durban and the second version at our 2008 Congress in Buenos Aires. So this is the third uh, version of the State of the World's Birds report. So you will find that some of the elements in the report are familiar to you, but I'm also hoping that you're going to see that there's some important new developments. So what is a State of the World's Birds report? Well, it shows us what's happening to birds around the world, and most importantly, it shows us how and where we can take action. And it also presents some uh, important uh, examples of our successes, and very importantly, uh, it presents the scientific basis for that work. As Carl had said in his introduction, science is a very important part of the partnership's work. It's our unique partnership the, that generate the data sets that we use, and we use that evidence base to inform all aspects of our action. So here you can see some of the um, products and reports that we produce. All our data sets, which we've been collecting over the last 30 years, are available over our website. Um, and we produce a whole range of different things like case studies, um, tailored reports. And one thing I should say is that when we come to analyze our data, we do that very much in collaboration with many other organizations around the world in order to get the best uh, information out of it. And I think there are many representatives in the audience today from those organizations who we thank very much. Another thing to mention is that BirdLife partners are increasingly producing scientific information at the national level. And here you can see a selection of reports produced by the BirdLife partners very recently. Uh, and this is based on the data which they generate uh, locally through their networks. And one of the really great things about working as a partnership is that together we develop the tools that help us collect the data, we agree the scientific standards that we're all going to work, uh, work to, and this means that we can generate very high quality scientific data. Um, and it means we can share those data, we can compare those data, and we can scale it up. One of the new things that we've done uh, for this particular Congress is to produce a first regional report. So this is State of Africa's birds, which some of you might have seen. So this has been produced by the BirdLife Africa Partnership and it showcases some of the scientific information which they've collected and some of the examples of the conservation actions which they're taking in that region. I know that you all know in this audience that biodiversity is a really important part of Earth's life support system and that our societies and economies depend on biodiversity. And it follows, therefore, that the conservation of biodiversity is going to be absolutely essential if we're going to safeguard um, that resource for ourselves for the future and that we need good scientific, scientific information to make the right choices. And this, is, this, of course, is where birds come into the picture because birds can be very good indicators of biodiversity as a whole. It can tell us about the distribution of biodiversity. Uh, it can tell us about the status and trends of biodiversity. And there are many reasons why um, birds are such good indicators. And I'm just going to mention a few of those just to set the scene. Um, we all know that birds are very popular. As a result of that popularity, of course, there, are, there is a lot of data on birds. Um, and, of course, it's those data that we need to tell us what's happening to the world's biodiversity. But also, they're very diverse. They're 10,000 species. They're found in all habitats. They're found around the world, as you can see from the spatial map of the distributions of those 10,000 species. And most importantly, the trends that we see in birds are mirrored by the trends of many other wildlife groups, and that's what makes them such good indicators. Another very important aspect for our bird data sets is that we can use them to focus down on where the important places are uh, on Earth uh, in order to carry out focused conservation action. And the BirdLife Partnership has been identifying these important bird and biodiversity areas, or IBAs for short, um, over the last couple of decades. And to date, more than 12,000 IBAs have been identified on land and on sea. And for the very first time in this map, you're seeing that complete set of IBAs. And what's so important about this map is that since the last World Congress, we've done a lot of work to identify the important marine sites 
Uh, so this is new work, and you can see those in blue. So the dark blue areas are the marine IBAs which have been confirmed, and the pale blue areas are the marine IBAs which are under review because it's an ongoing process. Uh, 3,500 um, marine IBAs have been identified since the last World Congress, which is a huge achievement. Um, and we've used a similar scientific approach to what we've used uh, on land. And this involves uh, interpreting the seasonal distribution of seabirds at sea, often using satellite tracking data in order to identify sites on the high seas and also to use habitat and ecological modelling in order to extend the breeding sites uh, into coastal areas. So it's a very, very important new development for bird life, and it's going to help us with our priority setting uh, for our marine work. So I'm now going to start showing you some analyses from the report, just a small selection. There are many more in the report and, of course, many more on the website. What do our data show us about the state of birds and, by implication, of biodiversity uh, at, at large? Well, the picture isn't very good. Um, where there's been systematic population monitoring, uh, it often shows that there are large declines in the population of bird species. And here you can see two examples of that. So you can see in Europe, for a suite of farmland birds, there's been a 50% reduction in their populations since the late 1970s. That's a huge loss. Uh, of those bird species. And similarly, for uh, migratory species, those that migrate between Europe and Africa, and particularly for the long-distant migrants, you can see there have been some big declines there too. And for this particular bird, bird that you can see in the picture, the turtle dove, in the UK, there's been more than a 90% reduction of that species uh, since the late 1970s. That's a huge loss of populations. And indeed, that pattern is mirrored uh, in many other places where there's been long-term monitoring. So we're just going to find out uh, what's happening in our host country, Canada, what's happening to their birds. The state of Canada's birds report shows the strong influence that human activities had on bird populations here over the last 40 years. The news here is mixed. The good news is that uh, waterfowl and raptor populations in Canada are rebounding quite nicely thanks to focused conservation efforts. On the downside, populations of most aerial insectivores, grassland birds, and shorebirds are showing dramatic declines. So Canadians uh, uh, continue to face some pretty serious conservation challenges. So as well as um, declines in common familiar birds, we also know that um, a staggering one in eight of all bird species around the world faces a risk of extinction. And we know that because we collect the information for the IUCN Red List that uses the categories and criteria of the Red List. So that's an interpretation of the population sizes, the range sizes, the rates of uh, decline in those. Um, and as you can see here, there are about 1,300 bird species that have a risk of extinction. And of these, 200 are classified as critically endangered, meaning that they face a very high risk of extinction in the near future. They're right on the brink of extinction. Um, so that's a pretty bad picture um, for birds, and that's a mirrored for many other taxonomic groups. Now, we've been collecting those data since the 1980s, um, and BirdLife has coordinated seven global assessments uh, for all the world's birds uh, since that time, and that has allowed us to pioneer the development of the Red List Index. What this index shows is how uh, species move between the categories of, uh, of risk. Um, so some species, of course, deteriorate as a result of genuine changes, and some species improve. But overall, you can see that for all bird species, the situation is getting worse. What this means is that bird species are moving faster towards extinction. And we can separate those data out uh, according to habitat types, according to regions, according to different taxonomic groups. And here you can see two examples which show uh, that for the Pacific species and also for ocean-going seabirds, um, these, these groups are in a particularly bad way. One new development since the last World Congress is that BirdLife partners are increasingly collecting uh, data from their IBAs. These are monitoring data, and from these monitoring data we can generate indicators. So these are indicators about the state of the site, the condition of the habitats and of the populations there, the key species, the pressures on the site, the threats which they face, the responses or the conservation actions being taken at the site. 
And to date, there are about, there's monitoring data, at least some monitoring data, for about a third of all IBAs around the world, which is an amazing achievement. And we're showing an overview analysis for that uh, sample of IBAs. And again, the picture isn't very good. What you can see there is that uh, for this sample, um, the majority of the IBAs are considered to be in poor or very poor condition. The pressures on them are considered to be high or very high. Um, and for two-thirds of the IBAs, the responses are considered to be negligible or low. And this has prompted the launch of a new initiative at this Congress called IBAs in Danger. And the partners, the BirdLife partners are identifying those sites which they think are most in danger of losing their critical habitats in the near future. And a list of over 300 of those sites has been um, produced for this Congress. Uh, and the aim of this is to encourage uh, everybody to take action at those sites um, to really tackle the threats which those sites are experiencing. Uh, we're going to hear now uh, about one of those particular IBAs in danger. Red Lake, uh, small lake, about maximum up to 500 hectares but located just in eight kilometers from centrum of Baku city. And this unique lakes, because uh, up to 200 and some years 800 white-headed duck have wintering here. Unfortunately, already from 2007, they began work for drying this lake because very big markets now uh, moved here from a place near the airport. Now about half of lake already dried. But even now, if we stop this process, even left of lake will be very good for wintering of some number of birds. So it's not surprising uh, that so many of our species are, in, are threatened with extinction, that so many of our sites are in a poor state, because we're putting pressures um, on species and sites as a result of many, many different human activities. And this, graph, uh, this graphic here shows uh, the pressures that are being faced by globally threatened birds around the world. Uh, it shows how we collect and analyze our data at many different levels. It's really important to understand what the threats are at finer and finer resolutions in order to be able to tackle some of the problems uh, and come up with some good solutions. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the graph so that you get an overview uh, and move around it sort of in an anti-clockwise direction. So you can see, because the proportion of this circle uh, is relative to the number of species that are impact, the unsustainable agriculture, you know, the expansion, the intensification of agriculture is one of the biggest threat to birds worldwide. You can see also that the spread of invasive species is a really important factor, particularly on islands. Many, many different types of pollution impact species around the world. You can also see that logging, particularly of tropical forests, is a particular issue. Over-exploitation of the species themselves is another um, factor that adds to their threat status. And then a whole range of poorly sited infrastructure development um, covering all sorts of different issues are also impacting birds in many different ways. And then finally, there's also the issue of climate change, which exacerbates many of those threats. So many species are experiencing a whole range of threats, not just one, but many of those things together. And we're just going to look at a few of these in a more detail uh, in terms of what scientific data we have that can help us understand this problem a bit more. So looking particularly at the issue of seabirds, you remember that those were a group that were particularly declining. Nearly all the, large al nearly all the albatross species are affected by um, fish fisheries activities. This is mainly from long lining, but also from trawl and gill net fisheries, uh, and also many of the large petrels. And here in this map, you can see how we can look at the data that we have to try and really understand that problem. What it's showing for one species is the annual distribution and abundance for that species, with the dark blue areas being where more than 70% of the population occur during the year, and the red dots showing where there's um, fishing effort, and the big red circles show where more than a million fishing hooks are set in that area. And looking at these data at uh, finer temporal and spatial scales allows us to really pinpoint where mitigation measures uh, will help to combat this particular problem. Another piece of analysis that we've done in collaboration with others is uh, looking at uh, where species are impacted by invasives on islands. Um, so this is, this is uh, information that's just 
being published at the moment. And it's looked at critically endangered and endangered species on islands which are impacted by, by invasives. And you can see there are clearly some very high priority islands there where eradication work would have a huge uh, result. Uh, for example, on Gough Island in the South Pacific, sorry, South Atlantic, um, there are six globally threatened seabirds, um, and they're impacted by this introduced house mouse, which predates, on the, chick, predates the chicks on the nests uh, and is having a devastating effect on the populations there. So uh, eradication of that particular species would really uh, pay dividends. And then looking at the complicated issue of climate change, um, we're doing a whole range of work to try and understand this more carefully. Um, some recent work that's just been published again in collaboration with others is looking at which species are most likely to be impacted. And then a lot of modelling work that's been done throughout Africa and also in parts of Asia, looking at how species are likely to move. This is really important for us to understand. Um, and here you can see uh, a view of the Albertine Rift Ma um, Valley in, the, uh, in East Africa, looking uh, particularly for 14 endemic species like this uh, regal sunbird and modeling how the suitable climate space for this group of species is likely to change as climate change takes place. And what you can see there is that the suitable conditions for these species are likely to retreat up the mountains and that's obviously going to put huge pressure on those populations. Um, this is very important for us when we think about the adaptive management of IBAs. We need to know which IBAs are going to remain important refuges for the species for which they were selected and which IBAs are going to be important uh, for species on the move. So, um, we've now presented some of our analyses that relate to the state of the world's birds, the pressures that they face. We're now going to uh, move on to uh, how we can use our scientific data to help us with some of the solutions. So we're going to start uh, looking at some quite big issues and then focus down to uh, some of the practical work that the BirdLife partners <coughs> do on the ground. And of course we all know that conservation costs money. Um, we know that conservation often loses out to many other interests. But we also know that the world's governments are uh, paying more attention to biodiversity conservation. And indeed, most of them have signed up to a, a new strategic plan for biodiversity through the Convention on Biological Diversity and also adopted by many of the um, multilateral environmental agreements. Um, and associated with that strategic plan are 20 very ambitious targets to achieve by 2020. And these are the so-called Aichi biodiversity targets. And there's been a lot of debate at the inter international level how much money is going to be needed to achieve these targets. So last year, some bird life scientists, again working with others, did a piece of research whereby they tried to calculate uh, the cost of conserving all nature. How much is it going to cost us? Um, and this was done using the bird data sets, but extrapolated to other wildlife groups. And they asked the question, how much would it cost to improve the status of all threatened species around the world in order to stop human-driven extinctions? And also, how much would it cost to conserve all the sites that are important uh, for uh, biodiversity, and by that mean, meaning uh, both protection and good management of those sites? And the figure came to 4 billion US dollars per year for species, and combined species and sites, um, 80 billion uh, US dollars. Now, of course, that's a huge amount of money. It's actually 10 times more than is being spent at the moment. But in this graphic, if you look at it in comparison to the global economy, it's actually really quite small. <laughs> and also when you compare it to some aspects of, uh, of, of what we spend our money on. And then if you compare it, on the other hand, with what nature gives back to us, uh, the provision, production of food, the provision of clean water, estimates for the value of nature are 100 to 1,000 times more uh, than what it would cost us to conserve all nature. This is a very interesting analysis. I think it's generating a lot of debate. And I think what it's really showing us is that uh, we shouldn't be talking about the costs of conservation. We should be talking about uh, investment in conservation because we get so much back uh, from nature. Another very important part now, increasingly important part of the work of the BirdLife Partners is uh, working with the economic sectors that are threatening biodiversity. 
so this is a uh, complicated work. Uh, it's new work for many bird life partners, but significant progress is being made. And this is an example of the progress that's been made of working through the Global Seabird Programme uh, with the regional fishery management organisations that manage the fishery stocks on the high seas. Um, and uh, BirdLife has been in promoting a six-step plan. Um, and you can see the progress that's been made. It involves things like recognising that there's a problem with bycatch. It, re it involves um, ensuring that these fisheries uh, organisations start using uh, mitigation measures, that they collect the data to understand what's happening on the high seas, that they use those data to refine the measures, that there's monitoring and compliance of the fleets, that there's continual evaluation to try and improve the, the conditions. And of course this is a win-win situation because in terms of bycatch, if you're catching something else, you're not catching a fish. So it, this really should work for this particular industry. Um, and you can see that some really good progress has been made around the world uh, in reducing the effects of bycatch. Um, we're now going to hear about another very important project that's attempting to, do, to, to, to take a similar approach, but with a particular focus on migratory species. The Migratory Soaring Birds project aims at mainstreaming uh, soaring bird concerns in uh, the, policies, uh, the, the policies in the countries located within the Red Sea Rift Valley Flyway in order to ensure that the activities and the projects pertaining to the five main sectors, um, which are agriculture, tourism, hunting, waste management and energy, that these projects do in fact take into consideration uh, the well-being of migratory soaring birds. Another really fundamental aspect of our work, an increasingly uh, important aspect of our work, is understanding how people depend on biodiversity and using that information to guide decision making. This has always been part of BirdLife's work, of course, uh, right from the start. Uh, BirdLife partners work very closely with people. But we've made some progress since the last World Congress uh, in our scientific understanding of, of how we can take this forward. So again, in collaboration with others, we've been developing a toolkit to help us um, measure and assess ecosystem services at the site scale using simple scientific methods. And it's noteworthy because up until now, these sorts of approaches have only been possible uh, at large scales using modeling, and therefore the results aren't really very useful at the, at the IBA level. All um, the techniques have been um, very technical and expensive, and therefore beyond the reach of, of many bird life partners. Uh, and in this graphic, um, it, this shows an overview of the delivery of ecosystem service services for the network of IBAs in Nepal. So this project has been piloted by Bird Conservation Nepal over the last three years. And what this is showing uh, is that for a range of ecosystem services, and you can see the symbols at the bottom, I won't go into the details of them, but if pressures continue on those sites, not only will the biodiversity be lost for them from those sites, but the ecosystem services that those sites are delivering will also change, and that will have a profound impact on different uh, communities of people. Um, and you can see that uh, in this um, uh, assessment, um, it, that it's going to be the local communities that are going to lose out if those pressures continue. So this sort of information, I think, is going to be increasingly important to us as we think about how to manage IBAs, not only for the conservation of biodiversity, but for the delivery of ecosystem services upon which many communities um, depend. Another aspect of our broader work is increasing uh, capacity at all levels. We need capacity to undertake conservation work, and BirdLife partners, particularly at the local level, um, are undertaking very targeted work, working with uh, local conservation groups through the local empowerment program. Um, and here you can just see uh, one aspect of that work. This is working with the groups to try and uh, help them become legally registered in order to become, uh, in order to have more of a voice in the decision making at the sites which they depend on. Uh, and in this review of the 468 local conservation groups in Africa, you can see again that some progress has been made. Um, so that for many of them, they are legally registered, and for many of them, they are taking part in the decision-making forums that will actually decide on how the biodiversity which they depend on and which they use uh, is going to be uh, looked after. So finally, moving on to then uh, what happens on the ground. I mean, this is a huge part of uh, the BirdLife Partnership's work, what happens at IBAs. There are many, many examples, and I'm sure you'll hear about many of these later on in the program today. We're just going to show you a couple of those relating to the protection of IBAs. 
Uh, and this graphic shows how protection of IBAs across Europe has really uh, increased over the last 20 years. And this is because the identification of IBAs uh, is then used to designate special, um, can be used to designate special protection areas. And you can see that in 1993, a fifth of the area of IBAs was designated as uh, uh, special protection areas. And 20 years later, two thirds of the area of IBAs is now protected through the special protected area network. And this is even more remarkable because um, 20 years on, there are many more IBAs in this network because more countries have joined the EU. So that is a really important um, bit of progress. And then just to say that the same thing is happening on the high seas. So whilst we've been identifying uh, important sites on the high seas, we've also been working through international processes to make sure that the identification of those sites is helping to identify uh, sites that are important for protection in the marine environment. And more than 500 IBAs are now um, contained within the identification of these areas on the high seas. They're not protected yet, but it's the first step in that direction. And here you can see just a little analysis for the Western um, South Pacific, um, where the IBAs are in that buffy yellow color, and they are helping to identify these important sites for protection, which are the dark blue. It just shows the sort of spatial relationship between the two. We're now going to hear about what it takes to really protect an IBA when it's uh, up against it and what, what the sort of work that needs to be done to really improve the protection uh, at a site scale. In one important bed area called the Mutolanganga important bed area, uh, this area, this, this IBA, though it's a little bit small at the time, actually is a very, very important uh, bed area because it is a breeding, uh, a regular breeding site for the African Peter, Peter Angolensis, a very elusive but very beautiful bird. So now when a proposal was uh, tabled by one uh, uh, corporate uh, entity uh, from Asia to actually cut uh, trees in this particular area. One thing which is also important to note is that actually this is the only area in Zambia which is endowed with uh, a tree, the species called uh, Mopani, called Yospema uh, Mopani. This tree species was supposed to be cut for no any other reason other than to be used for making of bats for guns. Yeah. So what we did, we mobilized ourselves, we took a lead, got in touch with other like-minded civil society organizations, including the site support group on the ground, including the school club teachers, patrons, and including pupils explaining what the situation is, explaining the level of the threat, and also trying to ask for their petition. So signatures were appended on different documents, they passed on to various authorities, and also we did our own uh, critical assessment of the area and uh, compared our findings with the findings that were in, the, in the, the environmental impact statement. Then we realized that actually their environmental impact statement had a lot of flaws. And we took advantage of that and began now to write to the uh, Zambia Environmental Management Agency objecting to actually the opening of that particular area for, for logging purposes. So through the strength and the, the power of numbers and the voices, despite fighting a huge corporate entity, the Environmental Management a Agency saw and were able to see exactly what we were talking about and they declined to actually authorize that particular company to go ahead in uh, clear ferrying that particular area. So finally, um, a lot of the action that the BirdLife partners take, of course, is focused on sites. Um, but at the en end of the day, we also sometimes need to focus down on species, those species that are particularly threatened, where we need some targeted action. And at the last World Congress, the Preventing Extinctions Program was launched. Um, at this Congress, we have produced a report on how well we're doing to really turn around the fortunes of individual species. And actually, it's really quite encouraging because uh, um, I think this is amazing that the BirdLife partners have taken action since the last World Congress for more than 500 globally threatened species. That's 40% of the total. Um, and indeed, for the critically endangered species, BirdLife partners have taken action for two thirds of critically endangered species for which there are known populations. So there's been a, the development of a new approach for um, targeting action for critically endangered species. 
This involves the establishment of species, bird life species guardians that take responsibility for conducting the actions uh, for, their, for these species in their countries and also the uh, appointment of bird life species champions that find the resources that will actually make this happen. And in this picture you can see the hooded grebe. The species guardian is the bird life partner, Arvis Argentinas, uh, working with the local Patagonian NGO. <coughs> and they are undertaking targeted work to protect the individual nests of this species uh, from predation and disturbance. And of course, that's going to have, um, uh, make a big uh, impact and improve the fortunes for this particular bird. We're now just going to see uh, three examples of some really inspiring examples of what can be done when you really focus attention on species in trouble. So starting with the fantastic work of the Albatross Task Force. The Albatross Task Force is an international group of instructors based in eight countries currently, so six in South America, one in South Africa and one in Namibia, and we seabird bycatch specialists, so we try and understand seabird bycatch, the issues that are involved with it, come up with easy solutions that can fit into our local fisheries, and teach fishermen how to use these measures and adopt them in our fishing regulations to prevent seabird mortality. So as an Albatross Task Force instructor, we go out to see obviously to create awareness. Um, so that's just explaining to fishermen what the problems are, showing them exactly what's happening out at sea and, and showing them the solutions that are available. In South Africa we've been very lucky that mitigation measures have been extremely helpful and they've actually been implemented as regulation into our fisheries by our government. And so within our two fisheries um, we have a reduction of between 80 and 90 percent since we've been starting our work in the early 2000s. And now another example looking at uh, how we tackle the huge problems facing uh, declining vultures in Asia. The main reason to save vultures, which was extinct, almost 99.9% .9 of the vultures got extinct in Asia. And the main cause was diclofenic. That's a painkiller used for animals. The interest started in 2000, around 2000 to save vultures with Dr. Hems Agarbaral initiating our uh, vulture feeding site. When they save vultures, what we do is we support community with income generation activities. How to sustain the livelihood, how to make them a part of this conservation activity. What we have done in the field with small initiation has given lots of impact. People say, yes, we want this project. We want to do it. We want the vultures to be conserved here because they're earning from ecotourism. The tourists come there to look at the vultures, the sites. So, when people are happy, I think we conservationists are happy because we're saving not only the birds, the endangered and vulnerable birds, we are also saving the life of the people. Finally, an example of what's been done to improve the fortunes of a Pacific island bird. Hiruri is a, a small passerine bird just found here in the Cook Islands. The last small pocket of them were found breeding on land that belongs to my family, so I feel, yeah, I feel that they are special. The, the most significant cause of the decline of the Rarotonga flycatcher are rodents. This project, its main, main activity has been the control of the predators. It has um, shown that um, by uh, controlling rodents, controlling predators, we can get the population of a native endemic species back up and off the endangered list. I hope this presentation has shown you how our uh, scientific information um, which is produced across the BirdLife Partnership is a really powerful way in which we can inform all aspects of um, conservation. Um, and last year we launched this report at the Conference of the Parties for the CBD which shows how bird da data can help to set, meet and track 18 out of the 20 Aichi biodiversity targets. Um, and now BirdLife partners are working with their governments to help revise their national biodiversity strategies and action plans uh, using some of the bird data to help uh, make that process as effective as possible. So finally then, just to wrap up, um, I hope uh, we've shown you, given you a, a good showcasing of some of BirdLife scientific information. I think uh, with that information, BirdLife partners are being increasingly effective at working with governments, with local communities, uh, working across sectors, working across borders, and indeed undertaking conservation action on the ground. Uh, and indeed, there, you know, there are many inspiring examples of success. 
But having said that, the data still show that we're losing biodiversity fast uh, and that we have a huge challenge to turn that around. And I think critically, uh, there's going to be, uh, for the next uh, few years leading up to 2020, a real need to increase the resources for conservation if we really are going to scale up our activities um, and uh, ensure that we safeguard uh, the natural world which we all depend on. So I just want to end by thanking everybody who's contributed to uh, the State of the World's Birds uh, project, all the partners who've developed many of the underlying data sets, uh, and many of our collaborators who've helped to analyze those data sets in informative ways. Uh, I personally want to thank all my science and information management colleagues who've worked with me on this project. Um, and we'd also like to thank, of course, the Argy Jensen Charity Foundation for their continued generous support for our science work. And it's really through that support that we've been able to pioneer many of these new scientific approaches that you've seen today. So thank you very much.